All right. Okay. So in your uh, chapter reading, the thing that's a little bit different from our um, textbook uh, orientation that I decided that we would use for this class is that they divided what's usually one mega chapter um, that is the DNA molecule and inheritance and um, mutations and a bunch of other uh, sorts of things like Punnett squares from just one giant chapter um, into two shorter chapters. And I do think that um, that's a lot better way to organize and it makes it seem more accessible. So you've got um, reading that on the um, embedded chapter goes from page 31 to about, I think just up to page 50 there. Um, so not too long, so about 20 pages of reading. That's the genetics part. So it's going to introduce the study of genetics. It's going to introduce really quickly a little bit about organization of the cell. And then most of the chapter is the DNA molecule, the RNA molecule, how they're put together, and what it is at the most basic level that they are producing. And so, in other words, what is the structure and how does it make code and biochemically what is code? And then at the very end of it, it's going to go and say, well, okay, DNA molecules are found in cells. So how do cells um, make life, right? How do they uh, divide? So there's an introduction at the end to the two basic types of cell division, meiosis and mitosis. Some of you have already had that in other courses. Some of you had great um, instruction in maybe high school, and so you might have gone through meiosis or mitosis. But in case you are worried because you've never studied it before, no worries. We are starting as if you've only heard the words, but you have never taken some time to look over how um, this conversation works or so forth. All right. So. Let me go ahead and share my screen and pull up the starts of this lesson, which is gonna be focusing this morning on um, genetics and the cell and how to work through the chapter. Okay. Is this showing up for you all? Am I, is, is it showing the way it's supposed to? Anybody? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just need to double check because for me I have, um, of course, as you have already been able to tell, for probably most of your instructors, never really taught uh, this particular way and sometimes things can be a little glitchy and so I wanna make sure that it's working. Okay, so nature and structure of genetic code. That is the biggest portion of this particular um, in this particular chapter that you're going to start with. Why are we studying this in our course though? With a course that's really leading towards our species today, why are we variable in the ways that we are? Why are we not as variable as sometimes the general public might um, think that we are? And how did we get to this form and when did we get to this form? Um, why is it that we need to take a look at this? Um, and um, and apply this, right, because this is going to go directly back to things that you were just uh, prepping for today in regards to Darwin's idea about variability within populations. So why are we studying in this in our course? In order for our course to stay on the scientific process and scientific activity, we can't just give you conclusions without telling you what our data set is, right? Otherwise, all you're doing is just deciding whether you trust the authors of the textbook or perhaps trust an instructor in a, in a class on sciences. So um, evolution is based on change over time. But when we're talking about organisms, then as you already know before you started class, that change is linked to your genetic combinations. So we want to give you the basic foundation on all that vocabulary and more or less basically how it comes together. So in order to understand evolutionary change, we need to give you an introduction to genetic variation. 
In other words, why is it that you are not exactly the same as any other human on the planet? And why is it that you're not exactly the same as your parents or siblings? In fact, actually, while overwhelmingly the base pair combination or genetic sequences in identical twins is the same, it turns out that there's minor changes that we may not be able to notice even in identical twins. So in order to understand how that works, we need a little bit of this. And in fact, actually, when we get further on in the course to understand um, a whole bunch of things that are going to come up later, we're going to need that vocabulary. One of the other big ideas, though, here for our entire course that is really um, important, important for us in the way that we operate today as consumers, and as voters, and as family members, and as individuals, um, and as people who may be really worried about um, changes going on in species and um, relationships between organisms on the planet today. When we look at molecular genetic genetics, one of the things that becomes really clear, even when you're a first step um, student or participant in learning about these things, is that what it really does is show that humans and other organisms all started off from the same starting point, that we are genetically related to everything else that's alive on the planet. If it's in your kingdom, remember, we prep that for taxonomy today, the classification and naming of living things. If it's in your kingdom, then it means that there's a huge number of genetic sequences that are going to be basically identical. But when it comes down to it, genetic code is genetic code for every living thing on the planet. So if you've ever heard someone say, oh yeah, you have a lot of uh, genetics that are um, the same as in corn plants, that's actually scientifically or empirically true. I'm gonna try to warm your brain up for questions you're gonna see this after, uh, later this morning too. Okay, so this DNA molecule. Why is that so important to our course? So there are three ideas here. So you just you know, label them one, two, and three, and I'll give you time to jot these. Firstly, the DNA molecule is so important in the life sciences and so important for moving forward in um, your understanding of what you're learning about in this course because the genetic code is universal. So the DNA molecule is universal. And that means that all life on Earth is composed of code in the form of DNA. And then a little bit here, we'll just get you get started, ready to get started on uh, charting out what DNA is. Oh, hello, Jacob, joining the group there. Okay, so all life on Earth is composed of DNA molecules. And DNA carries on very similar functions. So one of the most um, fundamentally inspiring things about all of this is that this is part of our data set that does confirm that there is common ancestry or another sort of spark of life for all life on the planet that we've discovered so far. Another idea for today in science, our conclusions are always our best possible current conclusion. There might be something that's discovered at a different time. So the only real difference between um, what we're looking at, whether it's plant-like, whether it's microscopic, whether it's a different mammal, and so forth, is just the arrangement of the DNA. And so a phrase right now that's not going to make tons of sense to you at the moment, but you want to get used to writing it down, is what is the um, minimum coding sequence referred to? It's called the base pair sequence. base pair sequence. Okay, so moving forward. So secondly, second big idea with universal genetic code, 
Organisms aren't different because they have a different form of coding structure. Organisms are just different because the internal sequence in the coding structure varies. Not because they're made out of something different biochemically. Okay. Now, next big idea here. The other second reason that the D studying the DNA molecule is so important to our course is because the DNA molecule is the source code that directs all cell function as far as we know. So DNA gives the base repository or library of all the code sequences for anything that a living things system can do. So for instance, we have source code that makes it so that our eyes are constructed to be able to um, take in and analyze different um, wavelengths of light or sources of light. But we don't have the source code sequence that would allow us to see, for instance, uh, infrared, but some other organisms do. So the DNA molecule series or sequence directs all cell function. Now, as you work through chapter three, it's going to introduce the nature and internal structures of that DNA molecule. And over just a few page sequence, it's going to introduce how that forms code that makes chemistry. So second one, DNA is universal for life. Number two, DNA molecule directs all cell function. All right. And the third or last uh, big starting concept this morning, replication. Number three, replication. The DNA molecule, as far as scientific inquiry at the moment, is the only known structure within a living thing that can copy itself. So replicate or copy. Those are our biggest three things to remember all the time why we're looking at this. The DNA molecule is universal in all living things. Number two, the DNA molecule directs all cell function that's necessary for life. And three, it can replicate. Why does replication show up here as so important? Because living things can't continue to live or keep going or appear in the beginning without this process, without replication. Your chapter three will have a number of, um, a number of areas where it talks about this, particularly um, on page 39 and figure 3.5. 39 and 3.5. A suggestion for you right now, and I'll keep repeating it, that in this particular, from this part on in the class, when you're going through your reading or when you're using any of the materials that I might post online um, to, to help you or to reinforce or to explain maybe in another manner, sketches. You're gonna start seeing, we, there's none today um, on your assessment today, but now sketches 
diagrams, JPEGs, looking at something and knowing what you look, you're looking at, or looking at a chart and seeing that they're showing you different subdivisions, that is gonna be really key. So when we make uh, our own materials in order to remember something, using your hands, um, and all empirical data shows that we remember it and we're able to access it and use it and understand it better. So if you do quick sketches of those same things that are in your reading, you're going to be able to remember it better and see it more quickly when you move on in chapters or when you're answering some questions about things. So um, the replication is probably one of the simplest diagrams in all of chapter three. So um, that one is a, is a good place to start with that concept. So why is it that the DNA molecule has to replicate? Well, obviously for repair. Okay, go ahead, Matthew, you want to just um, uh, talk? Well, I just wanted to ask, uh, double check, it was figure 3.5 you said? Yes, um, let me, because there's, um, yes, the there's others that have different figure ones, but 3.5, you'll see it there on page 39. And there's actually several um, several paragraphs there that say DNA function one replication there. Okay, I found it, thank you. Okay, good, all right. All right, so repair, right? Now, repair, linking this to where you're gonna be at, as you go through the entire chapter, repair is, takes place when the cell needs to make a copy of a cell that's been injured or damaged. So repair actually is a natural and expected form of just cell copying, exact copying, not making any differences or variations in it. So repair, towards the end of your chapter, mitosis, M-I-T-O-S-I-S. -I -S. What's another function? that requires DNA replication, growth. So obviously you didn't get to where you are today without being able to grow. Now, as we mentioned in our last class meeting, um, and um, you already know that the DNA molecule isn't all doing everything all the time every day. So with growth, there are a lot of functions that are turned on that are being directed by DNA that eventually shut down. So for instance, all of you in class, um, most likely, unless you have a small variation, you have formed all of your adult teeth and if you have those so-called third molars or wisdom teeth, if they haven't come down through the gum and emerged, um, they will do that really, really soon. There is a small percentage of people that actually don't grow that third uh, molar. Um, puberty should be completely shut off. Um, Biofemales, statistically around 18, you have no more height or length growth that gets shut off. I was so crushed when I found that out because, <laughs> um, yeah, I was the shortest of all my friends when I got to that. I was like, oh, I might still grow because I'm only in college. Yeah, that was done. Your brain is done. Your brain is done growing and done elaborating. It does grow some new connections and things during puberty, which is why we get emotionally volatile during puberty, but that's probably finished for all of you as well. And more shocking uh, really than any of those observations to me was when I realized that um, and was reading more specifically about your heart and um, what happens when people have, when they say you have a weak heart or a damaged heart. Once your heart is done growing, once your heart is done growing, it does not repair anymore, it's done. So if you have a heart injury, a tear, something because of a crushing accident or impact on something else or a portion of it dies for another other reason, it doesn't actually repair, which is shockingly, yikes, right? I, I just, that never occurred to me your heart couldn't repair because your muscles can, your skin got, does, and that sort of thing. Okay, repair and growth, those are keeping you going and getting you to where you're gonna be. And then maintenance. Your body is, your DNA molecule is replicating 
on a fairly regular basis, faster for some organ systems and some functions and much more slowly for others, like faster for skin replacement. And right, it just gets old and it flakes off and, and moves on. That's not the same as repair, uh, but much more slower for maintenance of bone. As we get older, bone maintenance gets really, really slow. So when you're really young, your bones repair and maintain and strengthen really fairly quickly in your middle and reproductive um, excellence years up until your late 30s in uh, Homo sapiens. Your uh, bones are going great. And then as we get older, they maintain and repair very, very slowly. And because um, your body isn't too worried about uh, being able to use them anymore. And what's the last reason we need replication? I know you're already thinking of it. Um, and that is reproduction. So these three, repair, growth, and maintenance, that's just regular cell division. M-I-T-O-S-I-S, -I -I mitosis, the one that's easier to spell. Reproduction is one where it, the cell doesn't just get copied. It has to be a altered variant. And so reproduction is a different type of cell production called meiosis, M-E-I-O-S-I-S. -I -I so you have a video embedded in Canvas for this unit on meiosis, because that one's more complicated. And that's the type of cell division that really makes a difference in chapter four and in chapter five and for the rest of the course too. All right, so those are our four basic things why DNA replication, the DNA molecule being able to make more copies of itself would be necessary. All right, so let's go back then. So that was just a little intro there. So let me give you this morning some outline suggestions. So the four big bullets here, genetics is the overview part. A different set of pages would be cells, the basic types of cells. We're going to do that this morning before we log off and I send you uh, forward with your um, time to take a big break and then get ready and log into assessment. Your third one is the longer body of the chapter, DNA structure and function. That one starts on page 37. goes all the way over to 45. So that is the longest, most complex, most loaded with vocab section here. So for this one, as we're looking at it right now, in Canvas, and I am um, admitting that it's not the smoothest work I've ever done, but right when it became obvious that they were not going to let us come back to finish up our semester last semester, and that there are certain things that are way better when we're in the classroom because you can see better and so forth, I did um, take one of my allowed emergency last minute visits to use a whiteboard with no audience or anything, dragged in a couple of a light stand and, and a stand for my, for my um, um, camera and then just videotaped real quickly two ways to organize your notes to put together for DNA structure and function. They're not perfect. I was obviously rushed. They're in there in Canvas now in two 15 minute chunks. They are captioned and they will help you put together notes for this particular section. Um, you'll be doing them um, in a much more leisurely way and more organized and so forth. So we'll come back to that a little bit, but it's already in there with a real specific um, 30 minute lesson divided into two video chunks on how to get all that vocabulary and the diagrams and the stats and the uh, biochemistry part for output um, all together on one chart that you can use to practice, refer to, and so forth. So that's already made for you in this one. And then the last section of the, char the, the um, chapter is cell division. So that's gonna really start towards the end. 
It'll be just this last few pages there, the bottom of 45, all the way over to the last of the pages that you're looking at. During cell division, this one, the key to genetic diversity meiosis is the first introduction to changes in the DNA sequence. And that'll be just the last two pages of your, of your reading for that one. So if you put your notes together this way, so genetics and overview will be from the first page and it will also uh, go over the modern um, professions within genetics and make that separate. And when you review it, review it separately, then go on to the cell part. That's just a couple of um, pages there. It doesn't go too long um, for there. There's a nice diagram. They always look pretty similar. And we're gonna talk about real basic types this morning. And then this one with some of my suggestions on how to put together a long horizontal chart that gets a ton of stuff all together and related to each other, then this will flow um, really well. So those of us that are here right now using these suggestions um, probably find that its organization is key on this. And then it'll make it so you have less stress and more likely that it'll just go perfectly e not easy, right? Learning nothing, uh, something brand new that's complicated doesn't mean that it doesn't take some time, but it isn't gonna be a panic situation. Okay. So this is what um, my suggestion is that you should be heading for by the beginning of next week with chapter three, especially for that big chunk in the middle. Being able to make a diagram by hand. You can pull up a ton of them from the internet or from your textbook or from other sources. But when we, and this is just an acknowledgement of how, um, especially for humans, for hominins, and for primates in general, we explore the world with our hands. And that is part of our always been our survival strategy for millions of years. So when you use your hands, and some of you who really are much more interested in arts, creativity, music, and, and communication, and expression, and things like that, are, are happy to hear this. When you use your own hands to draw something, to draw the arrows and link it in, rather than just moving your fingers on a screen, you actually recall it faster and more accurately within a shorter period of time. So this is a suggestion for um, emphasis on um, time savings for this one. So if, um, and again, this is also what I have put together for the video that's in there, a column for some extra details, a column for your terms and structures, a column to diagram the components that will be like your figures, right? Like um, uh, the, uh, the internal structures that we see when we're trying to give you an illustration and then a column to label output. Output is the biochemistry. It's what code is in living things. So what is it that those structures make? All right, does it make a lot of sense to you this morning unless you've already had a similar class, but just want you to have that there in your toolkit before you start, because if we don't have the map before we start, it takes us longer or it's more frustrating to get to our destiny. All right. So, and this one. The highlighted terms right here, this is like a little mini homework, you all, for these. Um, again, I used to present it and it students didn't do as well with it until I said, okay, do a mini homework and work on this. Um, so firstly, recognize that means for um, visual questions, for a diagram or for a JPEG. The difference between DNA and RNA. Right, being able to function in our society today with health, with the news, with hearing about research, with um, listening to these uh, media summaries about how do we know that it's this species and not this species, again, example of this one, that I'm sure isn't really making sense to a whole bunch of people on the planet. Um, I was listening to some news yesterday about uh, resurgence of um, infections in some areas where the passing along of COVID-19 seemed to be really slowed down. And one of the things they picked up in one of these areas, not in the US, we've actually never slowed it down. We just got to the peak and now we're staying at the peak. 
because we're naughty and we want to play and we don't like um, apparently listening to organizations uh, ask us to do things in a particular way in the US. So, so far in the US, uh, the best data we have right now is only 50% of the population seems to be actively concerned about not passing or not contracting COVID-19. But this, so this was in another country. And what they said was, is people started getting sick again after about a month of having it really have died down. And so they went closed down where they thought the origin of this new spread was and taken some samples. And the DNA sample indicated that the strain that was there was a variant of COVID-19 that's a little more common in Europe than where they picked it up in Asia. So again, business, trade, travel, import, export sorts of things. And so, yeah, so they're able to tell even slightly differences. The term triplet and codon, these two are important here. They are a core part of understanding how the DNA molecule comes together. But the thing about these two is that that code series, that vocabulary for that internal sequence series called triplet gets transformed, edited, and turned into something that's very similar structurally, not exactly the same, but very similar structurally called a codon. Triplets, you all, relate to DNA. Codons are created after RNA does its editing. So triplet and codon, you want to be sure that you um, can see where those are on a diagram that you know that you want to be able to work with those. Now, chromatin, chromosome, and chromatid. What happens is that in reality for this particular science, coding strands, and you've all heard the term chromosomes, I'm sure, um, and some of you know more details about chromosomes already. Chromosomes are involved in different stages when they're going through cell division or the reduction to division that, that makes um, sex cells or gametes that we reproduce with. So depending on the stage of its occurrence, sometimes we call those coding threads chromatin when they're in a particular stage of activity or inactivity. Sometimes we are terming them chromosomes. You'll see both of these in diagrams in your reading. And sometimes that thread is in a state or a phase where it's termed chromatid, the chromatid state. So do look for those. You're going to see some questions on the vocabulary, right, in word form, like defining this or saying what they are doing. But you'll also see questions on these asking you to do identify a visual representation. And all of these, um, chromatin, chromosome state or chromatid state, they can be photographed with a scanning electron microscope or sometimes just a light microscope um, today. So what do they actually look like? So that then as you leave this course and you hear things or there's something happening at the doctor or you're interested in inheritance or you become uh, a professional within healthcare, that those will make perfect sense to you because they're part of that sort of core concept. Chromatin, chromosome, chromatid. When we look for something on our own and then we put, put it together, then it just sticks and we remember it for a long time. Okay, so I'm not going to linger on this one. I'm just going to show you what's there because this is simple. Let's go back. This is simple. I just want you to know that I'm not going to go over it in detail, but you need to prep this part. So your first general overview for chapter three is a section and they're bulleted. So that's usually a raging flag there of yes I need to take a good look at this so the study of genetics it's on the text page 32 goes over to 33 um, when somebody is um, trained within this particular field and then they finish degrees sometimes a master's or also a PhD degree and they're doing their work within it then there are five broad specialties that we go in. Cellular and molecular, so what all you need to do with these is just know what it is they're mainly doing. What's called classical or Mendelian genetics. 
give you a tip on this one. This links directly to chapter four, inheritance, classical or Mendelian genetics. Population genetics is another field. We'll be looking at uh, summaries of that as we go through the course. Something called phylogenetics and then behavioral genetics. Of all five of these, you could probably just guess, even if you hadn't looked at anything or heard anything, that this one, behavioral genetics, is the one that is the most um, argued over and that doesn't have the clearest kind of links per se. I can tell you right now though, even before we start, there has never been any discovery within families, populations, or other kinds of subcategories of Homo sapiens as a species globally, where there are any particular combinations that always result in people that are violent, or people that cannot get along with other people, or people who um, cause disruption, harm, or injury to other members of their species. So there's no link between um, anything genetic and, for instance, anywhere on the planet, uh, prison populations um, and so forth. There are some people that do have um, learning issues that isn't related to crime, in fact. But so, yeah, this one is something under investigation, but we don't have any clear, um, clear results from this at the moment. So, but at least recognize them. All right. So now the second outline, basic blocks. So that's what I want to work on you for a few minutes this morning. And then um, that's what we will call it a day. So the cell. A cell is a microscopic organic entity that is alive. So all cells are too small to see with the human eye. We don't know if any other organisms can see them that have eye-like structures, but we can't. So we didn't know that we were going to encounter these colonies or these populations of living things until microscopes, strong microscopes were invented. So this is some, one of those new kinds of things that we're discovering as humans. Organic, remember, life, organism. Right now on the planet of what we can't discover that's currently alive, lucky for you all, we have only two basic generic divisions. The first one and probably the most diverse selection of genera and species are called prokaryotes. Prokaryotes. Now, um, again, part of you meeting with me or us all together is so that I give you a little bit more tips and hints and explanation. These are terms that are in your reading, but being able to do more with them, you know, is more than just a definition, right? Um, and being able to have the whole rest of these types of courses go more smoothly for you, which is always my, one of my goals. So the prefix pro, like proponent, or for people in theater arts, proscenium, or a prototype, Pro means in front or before. So when you see this, prokaryotes, it means that this is the earliest known form of living thing on the planet. We do have empirical data in the form of fossilized outlines of these single-celled organisms from not the oldest rocks on the planet, but from some that are excessively ancient. So this is how we get this um, basic rounded off number that life begins about 3.7 billion years ago. Now, 
3.7 billion years ago. Oh my goodness, uh, incomprehensible. Actually, I can't even really think of what a million is, but you know, I work for the state, so large numbers, which don't have anything to do with my uh, earnings paycheck or value, um, are outside of my personality uh, grasp on these. But 3.7 billion years ago, remember the planet seems to have all of our data pointing to around 4.5 billion years ago. So it's almost a billion years after the Earth is coalesces before the right chemistry comes together to form these living things. So for your notes, all prokaryotic species live in just one cell. They do not require any extra cells to carry on any extra or diverse functions for them. So they are called single-celled organisms. Oops, we're gonna go back for one. Sorry, that was too early for that one. Now, do prokaryotes have DNA? All living things have DNA. So prokaryotic organisms do have the DNA molecule. They just have a slightly different internal organization as to what's going on to allow the DNA molecule to do its work for them. So all prokaryotic species, and they still exist, are single-celled organisms and they do have DNA. Next grouping are eukaryotic organisms. And look how much longer it goes. While well, it takes only about a billion years to get these single-celled organisms, it's two and a half billion years later before we have any empirical data that the next form of cellular life or cellular organization that leads to life appears. And obviously then they are a mutated form of prokaryotes. What's the biggest difference for your notes? So these are called eukaryotes. The biggest difference is on the internal organization of the cell. They have a internal walled off area that we call the nucleus. Nuclei here on the slide is the plural. So in prokaryotic organisms, they have DNA, but they do not have a nucleus. In eukaryotic organisms, they might be single-celled organisms, but they also have the nucleus. And in that nucleus, that's where their DNA lives all the time. So that's the big difference, the fundamental difference. And they are much younger. So what's another fast, um, college student success tip to remember these. Pro, yes, does mean before, but eukaryotic sounds like Y-O-U, right? You, you, and so, yeah, you are eukaryotic. So your cells all have a cell nucleus, all of them. All of them have a nucleus. Unless it's something living on you, right? Like something that's a prokaryotic organism, and then it's not, but it's not part of you. It's just riding you around. Okay, everybody good so far? Any question or anything else? Nope, so far so good, right? When we start and we take it slow and evenly, everything comes together. It's just the repeating it so you remember it part. Okay. So let's look at a visual here on the key differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic. Um, so that again, if you see a visual question, it will um, be something that you can relate to. Okay, so the, in this one that just popped up, um, the image on your far left that looks like it's got little hairs around the outside and a little tail, that is a one variety of a prokaryotic organism. And what you can see there that's important and why I picked this particular um, diagram of this particular species is just because an organism is single-celled doesn't mean that it can't move itself around or cling or do some directionality. Lots of them can't. They don't have the flagella or the tail, or they don't have the pili, the little hairs on the outside, but many of them can. So the biggest difference here is 
That is the entire organism. It only needs one cell in order to survive. And it has those internal divisions that you're seeing in your diagram and um, in your reading about the cell anatomy. And the key idea of those divisions is the, is the vocabulary term of organelles. Those internal divisions inside are called organelles. Okay, hello, Nicole. Like little organs. In this case, it does not have the organelle that makes a basic little different room inside where the DNA molecule lives. So it's loose or floating, but you'll see lots of little specks, spots, long tubules, and other things going on. Now, all cells, whether they are prokaryotic versus eukaryotic, do have permeability through the outer cell wall or membrane. And then also on the inside, there is, just in everyday English, so we can just be, because we're not going to do this for the entire course, um, it has a sort of fluid goo, which is your cytoplasm. And so things are moving around on the inside. Now, look at the larger, rounder one. That's usually, they make it look like one of those balloons that's got extra stuff inside, or a beach ball, or a um, global, uh, I don't know, um, fish tank or something um, for these. Same thing, there's a cell wall inside there's the liquid fluid goo, the cytoplasm, and then everything that's labeled here is a different form of organelle. They all do different jobs, but the organelle we are most interested in at this particular point in the course is the nucleus, because inside the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell, the DNA molecule lives there all the time. So if you think of the DNA molecule as plans or construction, then the Nucleus in a eukaryotic cell is like the architect's office. The plans never leave the architect's office. So that means there has to be another structure that can come in and out of here, read the plan, and carry information back outside. And that you'll come back to later on in your reading. Okay, so this down here, and with a description here, is an example of a prokaryotic organism or prokaryotic cellular life. In this case, the majority, um, there's only two basic forms of prokaryotic organisms that are still here on the planet. And the one that seems to be the biggest inventory, the most universally everywhere, and part of everything are bacteria. Bacteria is one of the largest groups of prokaryotic organisms. They're divided into their own, um, into their own families, tribes, genus, species, and so forth. So right, so if you see an ad about cleaning up in your bathroom and it says you want to kill E. coli, which is a binomen, right, Asterichia coli, they are a form of prokaryotic life. They are single-celled organisms. All right, now this one below is a scanning electron microscope photo of something called a mycobacterium. That is not gonna be a testable question. I just wanna relate this to things that you are already seeing and that you see in advertisements and media and so forth. And this particular one is the species that forms tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is a very serious, um, condition that's caused by infection by this particular type of species. It most generally enters into your respiratory system, into your lungs, but if you have it for a really long time, it can move to other parts of your body as well. So tuberculosis or TB. It is a killer, especially when you're very, very young. We do have treatments for it that work pretty well most of the time for most people, but when very uh, young children whose lungs are very small and are still growing really fast contract it, it, it can really um, actually drive them out of existence really fast and very sadly. Okay, so 
this bacteria, and again, I'm, we are spending a little bit extra time because I want you to be able to see these as species because one, it's in our current news and two, um, it comes back in the last unit of the course. These species are gonna be like other organisms you've already heard about. They don't all live in exactly the same environment. They don't all reproduce at exactly the same rate, but they do all reproduce in prokaryotic organisms in the same way. And in fact, they clone themselves. So cloning is a natural process for cell division or replication in nature for the whole planet, but it isn't the way that multicellular organisms reproduce. It is the way that these reproduce. Now this one divides much slower. So they actually make a copy of themselves and then split and divide that copy off about once per day most bacteria that are studied that we're more familiar with and worried about on the day-to-day, -day, like for why we're cleaning things and putting your um, toothbrush in those cups where every toothbrush has to go in its own little hole so they don't touch each other if you have multiple people in your family and so forth, that's because the bacteria on each one of those are dividing um, about every 15 to 20 minutes. And that's actually, if you got up this morning and washed your face with a washcloth or a facial sponge or one of those scrubbers, brushed your teeth, um, those sorts of things, that's why we need to not share those between different people in the same family, um, especially between little kids and the parents. Between the parents sharing, uh, usually, unless the other person's obviously sick, not a big deal, but little kids can really spread things awfully, awfully quickly. So if you look down at the pink threaded structures down here, you can see down to the far bottom of the left, one that's getting ready to go through that. It's already copied all of its internal structures. The copy is gonna go to one half, the original DNA content is going to stay in the other. It's going to split down the middle and make two. So they get busy and do their thing. So prokaryotic organisms divide by cloning, and that's called asexual reproduction. They don't need a partner to do it. They do it internally by themselves. All right, so what types of living things are prokaryotes? Um, this is important, not for everything in our course, although we're going to come back to bacteria and viruses and a few other types of microorganisms uh, later in the course because they have an impact on us, but this matters to a number of other things that we're thinking about right now on our everyday um, activities here. So bacteria and another group called cyanobacteria. If they used to be mainly called blue-green algae or algae, doesn't depend to, for me and this course, doesn't matter how you pronounce them as long as you recognize them and you can recognize the difference in spelling and, and that they are actually different. Now, bacteria versus cyanobacteria. These were on the planet, their ancestors were on the planet two and a half billion years before the types of cells that form organisms like our modern day plants and animals like you ever even had the structural type of cell evolve. So they are everywhere and they are part of our lives. And in fact, lots of you already know, we actually can't survive and be healthy without certain species of bacteria. They help us to digest our food. They do the first part steps of food digestion right there in your mouth. They are on your skin. They are inside all of you, um, but different types stay in certain regions, right? Like E. coli should stay in your colon. If it comes out of your colon, it gets on your hands and on your face, skin, eyes, or in your mouth, it can make you sick. But when it's in its own environment, it is not bugging your system too much. So bacteria and cyanobacteria. Now, practicing again, things that are gonna really make life easier for you and actually maybe um, show you that you all are potentially the kind of people that can do very, very well in laboratory classes and look for um, professions, for instance, as lab techs and so forth. While there aren't as many jobs for people that have masters or PhDs, there's way more jobs of people that are running all these lab samples, right? So this is your first step um, about thinking about maybe that's a, a job or a career for you. Now, vocabulary in biology 
frequently sounds like what it looks like. And that's because some of these have been noticed for a really long time. So there are many, many species of bacteria that have the term caucus or cockle in their terminology, like streptococcus. But look at the word here, again, saving you review time. Caucus, the C is sort of circular, the O is circular, the C is roundest, rounded, the U is rounded, the S is rounded. These, this is a term referred to species that when they first saw them in the microscope, looked like little balls or strings of balls, sometimes in groups of four, sometimes in larger groups, sometimes like in a big um, long chain, sometimes by themselves. So one of our basics for even, for instance, giving a swab sample to look and see if you have an infection of something or identifying the species is to just see what shape it is. When you see the first shape, then you go and look on a different page on what it is you have. The second most common basic shape are bacillus. And these are rod shaped. And here you can see it again in the word. You've got the BA for bacteria, but see the ILL, -L, the long, 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 that's what they look like. They look thread-like. So that mycobacterium we just looked at is got the bacillus shape. It is a rod shaped species. And then the last one, even easier, is spiro. These look twisty. Um, like a limp curl. Sometimes they can be a little bit tighter, but like, a, like the term spirochete, and that's just based on the shape. And so if you look right here, you all, this one, we've got, um, this is a, a scanning electron microscope view, and then they, they dyed them so that you can see these a little bit better. We can see these long rod shaped Rod shaped um, shapes here. So these are, you all, what are these? You can unmute. So these are caucus, bacillus, or spiro. Bacillus. Bacillus. Now, what about the ones that look like little round circles here? Uh, caucus. It seems like that. Thank you for answering. It seems like that. And that's the reason why I asked you. But remember, um, especially those of you that are going to take um, lab courses, with eventually where you can use the microscopes again and, and get prepped up for this kind of either research or employment or so forth. Remember, the cytoplasm is fluid glue. So they're like floating in there um, in these cells like it's a three-dimensional environment. So if I were to, um, I know it's, it's in a diminished, um, diminished uh, size, but so for instance, if I were to hold this rod shaped item this way, that's flat face to the camera, it looks like it's bacillus, right? But what if it orients itself this way? See how it now it looks like a dot? That is three dimensionality. So these are three in three dimensional environments and you just learn how to do all that while you're working in the microscope um, for that one. So lots of people really like this, especially if you're someone that really likes working intensively um, in, on one task where you're not answering the phone and walking around and you wanna be focused, where you really do your best when you're focused and so forth. These lab type jobs, they're well within your, your potential skill set, and they are looking for people to train in these. Now these, okay, now these um, photos here over towards the right, they are gonna look orangish. You can see one of the strands looks like a series of beads all together. Um, one is already labeled, streptococci, um, so caucus there, but sometimes they group together in fours or in eights or so forth um, because they are different species and they might cling to each other or work in a slightly different um, environment. And so then the last one obviously would be an illustration of the spiro category. Now spirochetes, if we didn't tell you how tiny they were, would be SEM means scanning electron microscope for those of you that are uh, interested in that particular detail. So they're going to look like kind of wormy, like maybe they are worms, but worms are multiple cellular organisms. So these are going to be much, much tinier for these. So spiro. All right. So caucus, bacillus, and spiro. So looking for those internal things. And a lot of times to um, 
speed up your review or what you can cling in your memory, whether it's a mechanical course or whether it's something science or whether you're learning terminology for design or creativity or something like that. If you just ask yourself, does the word look like what I'm trying to remember or does it sound like what I'm trying to remember, that cuts down your review time by tons and then it, it sticks a little bit longer. There is one more for those of you that uh, might have something like this as your intended major. There are other shapes, I, but I'm not going to ask you or show you any examples about those, but those are called pleomorphic, right? So they're going to have other types of shapes that might be there. All right, team. Everybody good on this one? Yes. Okay. So cyanobacteria, we're, I'm not going to uh, do more with these. These are uh, probably the ancestral single organisms that lead to plants. And so they, um, we aren't studying that and we're not studying how plants manage energy or any of their internal forms in class. I just want you to know that they exist. Um, I picked this picture because I think it looks like fireworks and I really, really like this one. But uh, blue-green algae are larger than bacteria generally or cyanobacteria, but they are closely related because they are prokaryote. That means their DNA is loose inside of the single organism. They're typically much larger and frequently they'll live in these really large colonies. So when something stimulates their growth, you can actually sometimes see these blooms of them on still or standing water where it all looks really red or another oddball color. And sometimes they're using up so much oxygen that they're suffocating fish and other things that are in the water along with them. So, so photosynthesis, in other words, so their basic source of energy for the survival of those cells is, um, is UV radiation. So they're very much like more complex organisms that are called algae. Okay, don't need any more details on this one for us, just that you know they exist. So bacteria and cyanobacteria or blue green algae, what they have in common is they don't have a cell nucleus. And the term, for those of you that are in arts, you already knew this, cyano, cyan, is a particular pigmentation um, group that gives them typically a blue-green coloration. Okay, since I'm recording this, I'm going to move um, along. Just repeats the same thing there. They come in lots of shapes and forms and we aren't going to use any examples of those. All right, so this diagram here is this one down here, prokaryotic, the one that's just an art diagram, not the photo, prokaryotic or eukaryotic, you all. Is there a wall around where it's got the DNA labeled? If there isn't an internal cellular wall to create the nucleus within the cell, then it is prokaryotic. Oh. So here you can see in this, now this has had been color enhanced um, based on a, a number of, of different processes, but this is a very high resolution. Um, photograph. And here you can see a whole bunch of right, bacillus species here, some of which see right here where it's starting to pinch, it's going to copy itself and divide and make another one here. Uh, over to the pink one on the side, you can see that are, some are pinching. Um, you can see a bunch that are blue and going through the same thing. We also see some other structures in here that are other living um, prokaryotic organisms that are in the, there's some that are in the little uh, ball form. So they are caucus. I don't see anything here that's spiral or spiral, spiral um, shaped. You've also got something in there that looks like a big piece of wood. You've got some small other little globules and things because this is a big mix of, of items. 
And while this type of photography now, for those of you that are really looking for um, not necessarily degrees that are so technical that you're going to do something more within arts, photography, marketing, and so forth, this type of artwork is very popular among certain segments of the society. Um, for large scale uh, prints and things. But this is a very high definition photograph of poop or shit. So this is really what it looks like under the microscope. That big piece that looks like wood is what fiber is. And since everything moves through your digestion because of contraction, then that fiber allows there to be something that doesn't squeeze down and then just pop back out so that you aren't able to um, move things through your, your gut and back out when your body's done digesting them or using them. The, some of the smoother globules are fatty molecules and you've got some other uh, fibrous things in there that are part of that. So, right, so biology is awesome because even things that we normally think of just with our eyes or with our minds or our hearts as not being uh, interesting or being kind of disgusting when we see them really close, when we see that there's a lot more going on and they can be beautiful depending on how you look. Now the next one is, so right, these are in there because they're necessary for you to digest, therefore they're necessary for you to live. They are carrying on a lot of activities. I know that many of you know that gut bacteria actually gives single uh, signals and plays a role in your emotional well-being and the overall health of your system. So they're really, really important. In fact, your gut bacteria are so important that sometimes when people have either certain medical conditions or are going through certain types of treatments where they have to introduce so much radiation or so many toxins into your system to, to kill off something else, that they can actually depopulate these prokaryotic um, organisms to where there aren't enough of them to make it so that you can digest your food. So there is something that is done to save people's lives, which are actually fecal transplants, where they will take feces, they work them over a little bit first, and reintroduce them into a um, recipient's um, system to reintroduce all these other species. Um, back into your digestion so you can begin digesting your food. Usually the fecal tra transplant is best obtained from someone that lives in the household or has an intimate relationship with the person who is very, very ill because, all right, right, it's, you're already in the same environment. You're eating, it's touching, breathing, other um, activities together. And so probably their gut and bacteria and yours would be um, transferable and, and able to be tolerated. Now, there are species though that are not part of um, what helps us to stay well. And I know you've, you've heard of these as well. Yes. And there are some that cause a tremendous amount of damage. Now, this is um, a photograph that was um, voluntarily posted in combination with the medical um, uh, professionals and the patient. And really thinking about the world of humans all over the world today, right? The seven billion plus of us. Um, we can't even count how many people there are um, right now. This would be a person who really honestly is extremely fortunate. This um, is a young woman, um, got a, uh, had a small injury on her skin on her face and got the type of bacteria that we just generically call flesh eating bacteria. There's a number of species that do this. Her body couldn't control it and it was literally consuming and it was gonna get into muscles, this is her face, so it's very close to her brain and her eyes, right? So this is death-inducing for the majority of people on the planet. However, she is from a country and a social group that did have access to medical care. So here they have stripped off the outer layer that, where, that was the colony of these bacteria, of these prokaryotic organisms that were harming her. They leave it open a little bit. They need to, and to make sure that, it's, that they can manage some of the um, infection there. And eventually um, she did recover. That's why I picked this particular one. This person did recover. Um, they do a skin graft from elsewhere on your own body, as long as the rest of your body is not affected. Usually it comes from your lower back around over your hip area, it's smooth and, and it's stretchy there and it can, um, it doesn't have too many weird hair follicles or things like that. 
and uh, over time then the little edge-like scar that uh, developed um, by Stonefish recovered and was um, doing well um, later on. Um, if you're looking at it, those little yellow parts that are up around her um, cheek, that's fat. That's what fat looks like. It looks yellowish on everybody. It's pretty much the same um, there. And then some of the darker little spots are where when they did that peeling, um, they did have to either kill something off or there was a little bit of a bleeder and they had to stop that little bleeder. Okay, so, but the majority of these prokaryotic organisms are, they're everywhere. Most of them don't have any particular interest in humans. Many of them just live in salt water or they're only in different environments, doesn't match our biochemistry. And a huge number of them either are symbionts with us or they are better herders and they use us to ride around and feed off of, but you don't want to damage your food supply so they don't end up doing that. But there are some that are dangerous. Okay, so when you see something like this, prokaryotes are simpler than eukaryotes. Here are two single-celled organisms. So this one be, would be a star or a highlight in your notes. Eukaryotic species can be single-celled organisms. Protozoa are eukaryotic, but they're also single-celled. So all prokaryotes are single-celled, some eukaryotes are single-celled. In other words, they don't need another cell to make bigger structures so that they can feed, reproduce, and so forth. But the big difference there, and you're seeing it in the protozoan in this particular diagram, see where it says nucleolus, nucleus, nuclear membrane, that's an organelle, and inside of there is where the DNA molecule lives in the form on this slide that they're labeling chromatin, right? Remember from a few slides ago, when do they use chromatin? When do they use chromosome? When do they use chromatid with a D, all right? In prokaryotic, then they're just loose. Like, just think like ramen bowl. The noodles are loose. Okay, and so let's look at one more like this. So what's the difference between the two groups? Do they have all these lots of separate organelles, one of which is a nucleus or not? No nucleus, prokaryotic. Nucleus, eukaryotic. So again, are all single-celled organisms prokaryotic? Everybody? Say no, <laughs> write down no, no. Not all single-celled organisms are prokaryotic. Okay, so quick self quiz. Oops, it didn't come up. Nope, that one didn't work, okay. So let's um, summarize this in words. Here, eukaryotes, they have nuclei, that's the plural. You can write down nucleus. The nucleus is one of many organelles. Just think of the organs in your body. That's why they originally used that term. They already knew about if you gutted somebody or someone had an injury, like your intestines fall out or that there's separate structures in there. So when they finally saw it many, many thousands of years later under a microscope, then they said, oh, inside the cell, it's also got little organs, organelle. Okay, so that was a repeat. So we've got two basic types and then that'll be our day today and you'll be ready to start um, using the embedded materials and going through what is the DNA molecule and how does it relate to terms like triplet and gene and chromosome and so forth. All right, now in your body, so skip down a couple lines before you start this part because this is a different conversation. We're not gonna add any more details to prokaryotes but we are adding two more fundamental parts to eukaryotic cell types. Somatic. Soma or somatic means of the body in general. So for instance, if you've ever heard of a type of um, 
disorder or condition for people where they say they have a psychosomatic condition or disorder. The psycho part is intellectual, right? The biochemistry that the brain is thinking. And the somatic part means that that brain chemistry is causing something to happen in the body. So psychosomatic disorders are sometimes the sort of things where a person has an odd or un undesirable brain chemistry, where it's actually making um, messages that make the person feel like they're in pain or make the person feel, feel like they are um, exhausted or panicked or afraid. And it's because those chemicals have an output later. So virtually every single cell, and this is correct statistically too, so exactly copied like this, um, in an organism that is multicellular, um, like in kingdom animalia, which is our focus in this class, virtually every single cell, statistically 99.9999999% of the cells are somatic. Somatic. Those are the cells that keep you alive. Somatic cells are there to make sure that the organism survives and goes through its lifespan, potentially to reproduce. So that's the job of all of those. So heart, muscle, bone, nerves, hair, digestive tissue, your blood, all of those are somatic cells. In the beginning for mammals, some of those somatic cells start off as stem cells. And in terms of function, our vocabulary term for stem cells is totipotent. And probably lots of you have heard about this as well, stem cells or totipotent. Stem cell research was the product of a lot of controversy for some amount of time in the United States, and there are still some social or belief-based groups that are very uncomfortable with the concept of stem cell research. Lucky for humanity in general, this is not true of every culture, every country, or every economy, because stem cell research is how we hope to move toward being able to completely replace or repair non-functioning organs or uh, body parts in people once you are already an adult. So stem cell research is hoping to learn how to regrow or repair, for instance, your spinal cord what a difference that would be, right? To people that had suffered catastrophic injuries in military service or had had injuries and accidents as part of day-to-day -day life. This would help people who, as they age, have a organ, like maybe your kidneys are no longer functioning anymore without trying to find a donor that matches genetically as perfectly. So totipotent cells, you all, stem cells or totipotent cells, it's a short period of time um, during fetus and right towards the end of that particular period where every cell in your body has not gotten a job order yet. They're all just cells, but they haven't had it turned on from the DNA message, whether it's going to be skin, hair, bone, nerve, blood, your eyelashes, whatever it is. So that is also why some people are saving some of those um, cells from pregnancies now and trying to keep them um, preserved for a long period of time until the point where we can use those for certain types of therapies. Um, initially, the only way to collect stem cells was from fetuses and do the research, not, from, not for one particular person, but for people in general. And so there are some people who were not comfortable with collecting any of those cells from fetuses that spontaneously miscarried or had some other uh, type of early um, end to their lives before being born. So what are the functions that somatic cells have? They do all the work to keep you alive, all of it. Everything that makes you go day to day to day to day to day for a statistically um, expected lifespan of about 75 to 78 for our population right now. Not all of us live that long. Some of us live a lot longer, but that's our average. So as you get into 
as you get into um, the rest of the chapter and over to and the end of the chapter when it starts talking about chromosome pairs and into chapter four, remember somatic cells, in order to do their entire job, they need the full inventory, the full standard complement of chromosomes and code for the species. In humans, the standard total chromosome number is 46. So in all your somatic cells, they have all 46 chromosomes. That's why for um, DNA samples, for instance, when you're looking to link a person with something that's happened to them or something that they have may have done, that you can get skin cell, any other type of blood tissue, um, or a little bit of muscle, hair follicles, um, stuff out of the mouth, right? A little bit of the swab from your cheek, skin, cheek cells, stuff out of bone, things out of the, um, the pulp chamber in your teeth and get the full genetic signature because every single cell in your body that's somatic has your full inventory of chromosomes. Once they get a job, they don't do all the work they could do, but they do have the full code. So that total chromosome number for humans is 46. That's our total number. And code, again, is carried on, right? The structure of code is by the molecule called DNA. But DNA molecules form a long thread-like structure that generically is called a chromosome. So that's your coding, active coding structure, chromosome. Okay, now this particular image here doesn't have, so here's our second one and this is where we're gonna call it a morning. You can take a little time and then get, get going for your um, exam time. In this one, the large pink globule is a type of cell that's called a sex cell. The little blue ones that look kind of bluish on here, that's not their natural color all the time, are also sex cells. And in this case, you are looking at an ovum that has been um, swarmed by a small inventory of sperm. So one egg cell is called an ovum. If there's multiples, ova with an A, sperm is the singular and the plural. Now these types of cells are not somatic. These are called sex cells or gametes. So this is a picture of gametes. You can see that the ovum is much larger than the sperm. That's always true in mammals. There is one one-page handout on gametes in Canvas in module unit two, and that has some basic uh, everyday practical details about gametes. And so that'll be something there for you um, eventually when I answer some, answer some questions on them. Okay, so this is our other type of cell that's in your body, gametes. Those gametes do not have the full inventory of chromosomes or code, they only have 50%. The reason why is their only job is not to take care of you, but to make a new organism. And since the normal number for our species is 46, it means that if these two join and merge and make one new somatic cell, then each one has to have only 23. So in gametes or sex cells, they each carry half the total number of chromosomes. Okay, so here we are at the end of this one. I am going to end the show here for you. Um, for these, and so you've got some direction on where to go in Canvas right now. You've got some video to help you with the end of chapter three on meiosis. You have a couple of short videos I put together to show you a charting strategy that you can use with the core vocabulary for this. You have one handout 
on my uh, on gametes in there. And so after you finish up your other um, activity for today, tomorrow when you start and do some reviewing, you'll be ready to work on these. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, log out from all of you. The um, exam itself is gonna open up in a few minutes. It'll show, when it starts showing and you can see the instructions, then it means it'll let you in. And anytime during that hour window, you can log in. So it just depends on when you need to finish. It will uh, log you out after 25 minutes because that's the time limit. And also remember, if you leave the exam, that's it. It's submitted, it won't let you back in. So it's not like the quizzes where you could come back in and work on it. So. Um, thank you very much and best to you. And do remember that this is just an early uh, version of this. Even if it doesn't go as strongly as you would like, doesn't mean you're not going to be successful in the course, but we needed to finish the first one. Okay, good morning, you all, and thanks very much. Bye bye. Thank you.